Okay, uh, so today it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Kaso Okuju to give a, a talk. Kaso is a professor at Tufts, works at the intersection of harmonic analysis and time frequency analysis and analysis on graphs and fractals. Uh, on a personal level, Kaso was the first person to teach me about spectral graph theory, which has probably been the best course that I ever took in my life. So um, thank you for that as well. Um, so with that, uh, Kaso today will be talking about an awesome conjecture, the HRT conjecture. Um, take it away. Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, thanks the organizer for inviting me. And thanks for everyone who decided to, to join to hear this talk. Uh, part of it, a few of you might have heard, uh, but uh, I'm hoping uh, that this will sort of uh, convince some of uh, the participants and to, to maybe sort of uh, tackle this, uh, this problem. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some work that I've done um, in recent years. And uh, here are some of my recent collaborators. So Christina Frederick, uh, we just got started on a numerical sort of approach to, to VHRT. Um, I don't think I'll talk uh, about that because it's probably just like uh, just beginning. And then uh, Mustafa uh, Masluhi uh, was uh, a Fulbright fellow who visited Tuff uh, last year. So he originally come to work on a different topic, but uh, as you'll see, uh, he got like uh, addicted to, to VHRT. And so we end up uh, submitting the paper a few weeks ago, and uh, I'll mention some of the results. And uh, Vion Usa, uh, with whom I had also uh, done some work on this and um, who got also interested in this because he stayed too close to me. So my hope is that I can convince some of the participants today to, to keep working on this. So this is the outline of uh, my presentation. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to make the talk of uh, not that technical. I want to sort of uh, put a course like of a pro of a problem, the conjecture, or uh, some of the approach that have sort of uh, been uh, used to investigate uh, the problem in, in recent years. Uh, and um, maybe sort of uh, some mystery that uh, uh, I'm not sure if uh, point out to a positive answer or a negative answer to a conjecture. I'll sort of uh, talk about that. And the main thing that I want to get across is that I'm hoping that this is a call for some people in this audience to, to maybe attempt to look at how one can sort of uh, verify this, uh, this conjecture um, from a numerical point of view. So I'll, I'll show a few ideas that we've, we've done, but they are pretty uh, elementary in a way, but um, I, I think they, there might be a potential there to sort of uh, explore this a little bit further. All right, so I want to start with something that uh, many in this audience know very well. Uh, this is uh, the construction of wavelet. Uh, this is a uh, hard scaling function. It satisfies what we know today as a two scale uh, equation, which says that you can write the function as a combination of itself at uh, two different scale. And here we just sort of scale down by a factor of two. And uh, by combining these two shift of a scale by a factor of two, we recover the hard uh, scaling function. And as many of you probably know, this is uh, uh, the first step in trying to construct a wavelength. And uh, once we have a scaling equation, the coefficient in this scaling equation can be used to construct a uh, wavelength. And Dobeshi's wavelength, uh, which I just, I sort of put some picture of the first three here, the scaling function here, satisfy this, uh, this uh, kind of equation. So if I want to sort of uh, translate this into a different language, uh, what are these two, uh, these two equations uh, show is that uh, we can find like uh, L2 function, uh, non-zero L2 function, and uh, finitely many number, uh, real number, uh, so that uh, the system of function that comprise of uh, uh, scale, um, I think I sort of uh, did not sort of uh, have like a, um, a good uh, notation here, uh, but essentially the scale of uh, this uh, function and shifted uh, will be linearly dependent. And um, there is a small issue with the notation that I choose to use here, but uh, I hope you sort of see what, what I'm trying to sort of uh, get across. So what I'm trying to get across is that uh, if I scale this function by powers of two, I can make like uh, a linear dependent relation between these finitely many function. And uh, the Dobeshi wavelet and any MRA wavelet is essentially uh, a candidate for this uh, a solution to this problem. So around the 90s, um, 
people were working on both like uh, the Gabo system or Wavelet system and uh, Chris Hyde, uh, Jay Ramanathan and Bakash Topiwala uh, put up like a very simple question. What happened when you replace uh, in this, uh, in this uh, in this set here, what happened when you replace the dilation operator by just a basic operator, which is just a modulation operator? Uh, what, what can you say about the resulting set of vector? Um, are these function and functions still linearly uh, dependent or are they linearly independent? And that's what's uh, known today as the HRT conjecture. I just want to highlight that uh, there is a lot of work like um, in this um, wavelet uh, um, area in the 1990s, uh, 2000, early 90s, or late 80s and uh, up to 2000s. Um, I try to sort of count like the number of paper with wavelet in the title. Uh, I look on um, uh, a mathematical review and um, the search just with wavelet in the title uh, point out that there are more than 2000 article index uh, that were published and indexed by Emma uh, within these two decades. And so there were a lot of activity like uh, around wavelet um, um, uh, analysis and application. Uh, at the same time, if you look up a uh, Gabo system or time frequency analysis or frame, uh, I think I look up Gabo system and there were about quarter of this number uh, of paper that are indexed during the same period. And so uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that the HRT is still, is still open. Um, it seems like uh, people have not focused too much on it. And uh, my hope is that uh, I'm wrong and that uh, um, maybe in the next couple of years, uh, this problem will be finally uh, solved one way or the other. All right, so what's a conjecture? Let me state it exactly so that we, we talk about exactly the same thing. So I give a function, given a function G, uh, I'm going to define two operations. The first basic operation is a modulation, uh, modulation by frequency B, and then the other operation is just translation. So I'm just shifting the function in space by, by a number A. And the conjecture that Hyde, Ramanathan, and Topiwala put forth is uh, the following. Uh, given any non-zero L2 function, you can even assume that the function is a Schwarz function. And given any finitely many points uh, in R2, if you look at the set of all time frequency shift of this function G, then this set must be linearly independent. So if you want to translate this into just a specific statement, it just says that if you give me a bunch of uh, coefficient and coefficient, and I write down this uh, linear dependency relation, then the only way this is going to be trivial is that all the coefficients have to be equal to zero. So the only way to have a zero linear combination is that the coefficient CK are all equal to zero. So this is, uh, this is uh, the HRT conjecture. And uh, uh, just as I point out, it's a statement is in L2 of R, but if you prefer to work with a function that's really, really nice, you can assume that your function is uh, a short function. And um, as far as I know, this is still open uh, in this generality. Now, uh, I usually try to sort of uh, get people to think about this. I'm putting out here like a free example. I don't know if you, you're taking note or you're looking at, uh, uh, you're writing anything down, but these are a uh, free set with uh, four, uh, four uh, function. And um, I just want to sort of see if you, if you get bored at some point during the talk, you might want to sort of just pull this and then try to determine whether or not uh, these are linearly independent. And uh, you can pick your favorite function uh, to sort of uh, start thinking about this problem. So just to sort of uh, maybe make sure that we all are on the same page. For the first one, the set that I'm looking at, so for this one, the set that I'm looking at is lambda one, is a set of point zero zero, uh, one half zero, uh, zero one. And the last point is three, and then square root of two. The second set is, I think I keep the same point zero zero, one half zero, uh, zero one. And I'm just changing this one to square root of two, square root of two. And the last one, lambda three is zero, zero, half zero, zero one. And the last point is square root of two, square root of three. And so the question is, if you give me uh, any of these three sets, Pick your favorite L2 function or your favorite uh, Schwarz function, 
and decide whether or not to have a set of time frequency shift along this, uh, each of these four points is uh, linearly dependent or linearly independent. And that's, that's the HRT convention. At least a specific of a set of three examples that you, you might want to sort of think about if you get bored at some point during the talk. All right, so I do want to address a question. So wh who cares about the HRT conjecture and why would want wants to, to solve it? And um, I think I want to respond to this question by actually asking uh, you whether or not you recognize this question and whether or not you know the answer to this question. So the question is the following, does every pure state on um, the von Neumann algebra D of bounded diagonal operator on L2 have a unique extension to a pure state in the bounded operator on L2. Um, is this like something that you sort of uh, think um, deserve to sort of be investigated or that sort of uh, appealing to, to you? And I say that this is actually uh, the now solved like Cardison single conjecture. You, some of you probably re recognize this statement. And it was put forth in 1959. And I'm not sure if uh, when they were putting this conjecture together, uh, Cadison or Singer thought this was going to have like a profound like uh, impact on, uh, on um, applied math in general. And as you probably know, like the solution to this problem came from uh, maybe not uh, uh, unexpected like uh, area of mathematics. Uh, you will have thought that this will be solved like uh, from people working in operator theory or mathematical physics, but it was solved, as you know, by uh, Marcus Spielman and uh, Srivastata in uh, 2015, using some very, very interesting idea uh, that have like connection to, to, to many area of, uh, of applied mathematics. So just based on this fact, I feel like the HRT conjecture is a pretty simple problem, simple question uh, that we could ask any of our students like uh, we who have taken like a basic linear algebra understand a little bit about like linear independence and ask them whether or not this should be linearly independent or not. Uh, the last thing I want to sort of add is that uh, the HRT, I found it very addictive. I think this was a word uh, used by uh, somebody um, highly respected in, in the mathematical community. And uh, the second word fun was also used by somebody else who, 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 who when he learned about this problem, uh, said that this is a fun problem. So I, uh, I cannot agree more with those two people. Uh, the HRT conjecture is really addictive and fun. And the final thing I want to sort of mention is that um, uh, I look up this week and uh, I think there are only 19 published papers about the HRT conjecture since uh, it was put up in uh, 1996. So uh, we have our work cut for us. There is a lot one can sort of uh, do uh, that's still uh, out there. All right. So with that, what I want to spend the next few minutes on is to sort of motivate a little bit where this comes from. So uh, time frequency analysis or GABO analysis, uh, at least uh, some people consider that uh, they, they started with a question that von der Mann asked in 1932. And uh, a similar or uh, almost exactly the same question uh, that Denny Gabo asked uh, about uh, 10 years later, uh, which is given the Gaussian, uh, so you, know, you take your Gaussian and you translate and shift or uh, uh, modulate the Gaussian on the unique lattice, uh, square lattice. So you translate by integer and modulate by integer. And uh, what uh, von Neumann asked was whether or not uh, the span of this is dense in L2 of R. Um, and then 10 years later, uh, uh, Gabo posed essentially the same question. He said that every L2 function should be approximated by a series of uh, this kind. In other words, if you give me any L2 function, uh, I should be able to write it more or less as a linear, infinite linear combination of time frequency shift of, of a Gaussian. Now, Gabo was wise to notice that uh, the function that are here, the mother function here, or the, the, the atom or the element of this uh, system, uh, are not orthogonal. So he knew that this was not an orthogonal expansion. And uh, he went ahead to actually describe how one would be able to, to, to approximate a function with, uh, with a such time frequency shift of, of a Gaussian. And the problem was uh, settled later, uh, almost uh, 40 years later, uh, independently by Bagman, uh, Butera, uh, Giradello, and Clouder, and then Perel Molov uh, in, uh, in a different uh, work. 
And this is what sort of give rise to what's known today as Garbo theory or time frequency analysis. And just to sort of uh, make sure that we on the same page, I just want to put here the definition of a Garbo frame. So I give you a function in L2 of R, uh, I take a countable subset of, uh, of R2, and then I look at the time frequency shift of, uh, of, of the function G along this, uh, this, uh, this countable set. So lambda one will be thought of as a space parameter and lambda two will be thought of as a frequency parameter. So I'm going to say that this is a Garbo frame if I can find two uh, number non-negative, uh, uh, sorry, positive number for which this inequality uh, hold for all, all function in L2. So uh, I'm not going to focus on anything about Garbo frame in, in this talk, but I think I want to sort of uh, refer to this later uh, when, when I need to. So uh, you could sort of uh, say fairly that uh, the, the, the conjecture, the HRT conjecture came about exactly when people were investigating uh, property of Garbo frame and uh, their, their application. All right, so now this is uh, a background. I want to sort of uh, now get uh, down to some, uh, some concrete uh, example of a case of, uh, in which we know that the HRT uh, is true. So, to begin with, I just want to sort of highlight or uh, to bring to your attention again that there are two main data in uh, the statement of the HRT, the generator and then the set uh, lambda. So the next result that I'm going to sort of try to show is I'm either going to focus on the generator and then make a statement that's going to be true for all finite set, or I'll do the reverse. I'll sort of focus on the set and then make a statement that's going to be true for all L2 functions. So that's sort of the way this is going to proceed. Uh, the other thing that I want to highlight is that we do need like some integrability condition on the window, because if you give me like a function like uh, the exponential or take any sort of periodic function, then automatically you can see that you can make this like uh, linearly dependent by taking just a set zero, zero and one zero. And therefore we need like some sort of integrability condition in the statement of the HRT condition. Uh, there is a lot done like uh, with uh, pure translation in LP spaces or even like uh, in higher dimension or on group. I'm not going to sort of talk um, about those, those aspects. I'm just going to restrict myself to L2 function essentially. Now, the other thing that I uh, will do, and uh, I just want to sort of uh, make sure uh, when you look back at the example that I highlight here, you'll see that uh, all of them have like uh, three points that have the following form, the origin, a point on the y axis and a point on the x axis. And this is not an accident. And uh, the reason why this is something you can do is that you can always sort of uh, take your entire system and then shift it by one of the time frequency uh, shift of your of your of one of them. Once you do that, you can assume that the origin is part of your set. So by just shifting, I can make the origin part of my set. And uh, that time frequency shift will not sort of affect whether or not the, the resulting system is linearly dependent or independent. So this is a live like uh, this is on, uh, a unitary operation on the set of functions that you have. The next thing I can do is I can rotate so that one of my uh, points fall on let's say the y axis. Um, a rotation in this case will amount to just um, some sort of uh, metaplectic transform. Uh, and that's also going to sort of leave the entire system uh, invariant. So for instance, if you take the Fourier transform of uh, those time frequency shift, what you're doing, you're getting a new function. The window will just be now the Fourier transform of your original window. And the point that you get are just going to be a rotation of the original point with a rotation of 90 degree about the origin. And therefore, uh, if I do a rotation, I can always put one of the point on the Y axis and uh, I can shear and scale so that the point on the y-axis is exactly uh, at uh, zero one. And I can move by the shear matrix, I can move a, a, a third point to the x-axis. For that one, I do not have control anymore on where exactly that point is going to land. So it's going to be any point, uh, an arbitrary point on the, on the x-axis. So from now on, whenever I have a set of three points or more, I'm always going to assume that the point contain um, three point of this kind. So that's going to be something that you're going to see uh, coming up like uh, later in the presentation. All right, so what's known about the HRT condition? The first set of results that I would like to point out is uh, uh, I'll take G to be arbitrary and I will try to see what I can say. And the, the first case is the case of a collinear point. So all these points are on the same line. 
And uh, this is essentially just Fourier analysis. You can assume that the functions are either on the x-axis or on the y-axis. Uh, if you sort of write it out, you'll see that in the end, if you have like a dependence relation, uh, you're going to sort of be asking like a, a trigonometric polynomial to be equal to zero. And uh, Fourier analysis will help you to completely solve that. This actually predates uh, the HRT conjecture. It was uh, something done by Rosenblatt and Edgar uh, in the 80s. Uh, they work in higher dimension. They sort of uh, give a very almost like complete description on when translation of, um, of a function uh, on LP, on RD, uh, will be will lead to a linearly independent or dependent set. So that, that's pretty much sort of uh, a set of case. So from there, the next result that, uh, that's uh, complete is uh, when you have uh, n point and then n minus one of those points are on a line and the last point is uh, on, uh, on, uh, on a different, uh, is not on the line. So just to sort of uh, give like uh, a picture, the way I think about it is because I can put the point, one of the point at the origin, then I'm thinking that all the point are on the integer, uh, have integer coordinate on the y axis. And then the last point is somewhere on the y, on the x axis. And uh, so again, because you have equispace condition, you can sort of think that uh, Fourier analysis will have a play here. And uh, Topilwala and uh, Hamanatan and Heil in the original paper, they settled this case. And the way they settle it is just to write down like if there was a dependence relation, then you'll write, you'll be able to write like the transit of a function by A as a, a product of a trigonometric polynomial of period one, okay? And the function G of X. Now, here is where you have to use the fact that your function is square integrable. If you iterate this relation to plus infinity by sort of uh, taking a positive or uh, negative multiple of A, or iterate it to negative infinity by taking a positive multiple of A, you'll end up with a contradiction. And that's essentially how the, the argument works. Uh, there are a few cases that you have to consider, like the case where A is a rational number. And in that case, uh, the product of polynomial that you're going to have here will have some sort of periodicity. And if A is irrational, that way you appeal to the egotic theorem in order to, to, to solve the problem. So, a special case of this of this result is when you have three points. Any three point will be such that two of them can be on the y-axis. So I can put one at the origin, one at uh, uh, zero, one, and then the last one will be anywhere on the on the x-axis. So as a result, we know that the HRT holds in general for any set of uh, three distant points and any L2 function. And the most general, sorry. Uh, Something just happened here. Okay, I'm back here. So the most general result uh, is, uh, or one of the other most general result that I would like to mention is uh, the one by Linnell, who proved that uh, if uh, the set lambda is a subset of a lattice, then the HRT conjecture is true for any L2 function. And he used for this like some Bondemann algebra technique. And this also is true for any dimension. So I did not sort of uh, say this, but uh, the HRT conjecture can be stated also in higher dimension. And uh, here I'm just sort of uh, restricting myself to one dimension, uh, but uh, Linnell result actually completely solve the problem for lattice and uh, for any L2 function, even in, uh, in dimension greater or equal to one. So I believe uh, that uh, this is uh, probably of uh, a summary of all the known results when you don't put any extra restriction on the function G. So when you don't put restriction on the function G, the HRT is known to be true only in these three, three cases. So the other case is uh, uh, we can sort of now assume that the set of points is arbitrary and start making restriction about the function. So an easy or not that easy, but a uh, one to think about uh, is to assume that the function is compactly supported. And the uh, Heil, Ramanathan, and Topiwala settled this case in, uh, in their paper. Uh, this is what I'll think of as a um, sort of a hard analysis proof. Just write the dependence relation, use the fact that the set is compactly supported to prove that uh, it's impossible to have like uh, um, uh, a linear dependence that's non trivial. Uh, the other case that they work on is uh, they look at uh, the Gaussian. In fact, they look at the Hermit polynomial. Uh, take any function that's a linear combination of uh, Hermit polynomial 
uh, will be actually uh, uh, will lead to uh, a linear independent uh, uh, set of function if I take any arbitrarily finite set in R2. Um, the other very interesting result in this, uh, in this uh, um, uh, direction is uh, when you start asking to put condition, growth condition on, uh, on the function G and the Bonick and Spiegel prove that if you have uh, a one-sided uh, exponential decay, um, if you have, I mean, the, the, the one that they have about exponential decay, they also have to make some assumption about the point, but uh, the most general result is that if you have a decay of this form for your function G on one side, then you can prove that the chart is true for every, every finite set. Uh, I'll mention one uh, in a minute, and uh, that's uh, my work with uh, Masluhi. Uh, where we prove that if G is a restriction of a meromorphic function, so it's a, a function that's uh, holomorphic and separate finitely many points. Um, if the function is a restriction of such a function, uh, then we can prove that uh, the HRT is, is true as well. I have to mention that uh, the, this case was also known uh, by uh, from a work by Benedetto and uh, Abdel. I'll, I'll mention that on the next slide. So there is probably a little bit more known in this case where I start making this sort of uh, assumption. I take the set to be arbitrarily and then I start asking what can I say about like uh, the function. Uh, but then there are other cases where you sort of uh, make some assumption about the function and the set. And uh, here are sample of results. So some of the results by Benedetto and uh, Buriaya. Uh, here I'm focusing on the set of four points because as I said earlier, the HRT is known to be true for any set of three points. So four points is the next thing that we should sort of think about like uh, if we want to do any, any new work. Uh, so they put some condition on the function G and uh, if they sort of have that condition on the function G, then, uh, uh, then they can prove that the HRT conjecture is, is true. They also prove that the HRT conjecture is essentially true for all rational function in, in their paper. Uh, now I have two new terminology here and I'm going to try to illustrate uh, what uh, they mean in a minute. Uh, for a set of four point in one three configuration and set of four point in two and two configuration. So let me just sort of tell you what those are. So a set of four point will be in a one three configuration if exactly uh, three of the point are on one line and the last point is, is another line. So as I said earlier, I can sort of make sure that the point sort of uh, fall into, into this category. So this is going to be an example of uh, a, a one three configuration. And then a two two configuration will be one where two of the points are on a line and the other two are on a parallel line. So that's what a two two configuration is. So those are the sort of uh, case that uh, were addressed by in the work by Demeter uh, and uh, some of his co-author. So the two-two configuration, again, I just want to sort of highlight some of the idea because I'll come back to this uh, in a minute. So the way you sort of, uh, the, one of the key idea is to write down a linear dependence relation. So suppose that the set was linearly dependent. So the function of a point are uh, sitting on two parallel lines. So two are on the y-axis and then two are on a line x is equal to a. So when you write a linear dependency relation, you have like a product of a polynomial, uh, a trigonometric polynomial of, of period one and G of X is equal to another trigonometric polynomial multiplied by a shift of G by A. And then here again, you want to iterate. Uh, using the ergodic theorem is uh, a little bit tricky here, but uh, one of the things that Dimitar and uh, Zaharescu sort of brought to play here was that they were able to actually use this ergodic theory to, to, to prove that uh, in this situation, the function of uh, the, the four point have to lead to a uh, linear depend, uh, independent set for any L2 function. All right, so just to sort of recap where we are here. So the HRT is true for any L2 function uh, and three point and four point is what, uh, what sort of, uh, at least in my view, one of the next thing to sort of think about. Uh, I've sort of uh, just pointed out that uh, when the three, uh, when we have a one three configuration, meaning that three of the points are in a line and then the last one is on a different line. Uh, if the points are equally spaced, then the HRT conjecture is true. Uh, that's the work by Demeter. So I did not sort of uh, probably stress that, but there is an extra condition here. The function G has to be a short function for the one three configuration to be true. 
And uh, in the case of two two configuration, then the HRT conjecture is true. But in general, we don't know what happened for the HRT conjecture when I give you any four arbitrary points. In fact, even in the one three configuration case, um, it's not clear when you sort of uh, goes uh, go from a Schwarz function to an L two function. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So my thinking so far is the following: uh, we know it's true for three point. I'm just trying to sort of pick a fourth point for which is going to be true. And uh, you can sort of think about this in a more general setting. Suppose like you know that the HRT conjecture is true on for a set of points that are on the same line and you give me one extra point, what can you say? And uh, this is uh, one of the earliest results that I obtained in this direction. So given any number n greater or equal to three and any function in L2, Suppose that make the assumption that the HRT conjecture is true for this G and this one n minus one configuration. So n minus one of these points are on, on a line and one is off the line. Now you can already sort of see what I was I'm trying to, uh, to do here. I'm trying to sort of develop like a, a, a recursive argument to prove it, right? Because I know I, if I can prove it for one and three, then I can prove it for one and four, I can prove it for one and five and so forth. So that was uh, the, the, the idea behind this theorem. Uh, I wasn't able to get exactly that. What I, I could prove, I could conclude here is that if this is a case, then there can only be at most one equivalent class or bad function for which the HRT conject, oh, sorry, not, not function, a bad um, uh, set of points for which the HRT conjecture is, uh, is going to be false. So here I mentioned an equivalent class here. So what is that equivalent class? The equivalent class will be all the, all the operation that you can do to your set of points without changing essentially the HRT conjecture. So one will be translation, for instance, shear will be inside, rotation will be inside. Those are the things that are going to sort of lead you to create this equivalent class. And so what this result is saying is saying that if I know that the HRT conjecture is true for all one n minus one co uh, configuration, then there can be at most one class of equivalence of one n configuration for which is going to sort of be false. Uh, ideally, we want to sort of prove that uh, uh, this set is actually empty. And I'll show you that this is indeed the case uh, later in the talk. But one easy corollary of this is that the HRT conjecture holds for all one free configuration. If you make one more assumption, if you assume that the function is also real value. So I just want to highlight uh, this phenomenon for you quickly, and then we're going to sort of uh, go to some of the new results. So here, I just want to prove this, uh, this last part. Um, so assume that you have a set of four points and assume that uh, the system was linearly dependent. So I can write it uh, as a linear dependence relation. Uh, but because the function is real value, I can write exactly, take the co complex conjugate of this relation. And uh, if you sort of uh, get rid of these two sides, what you end up with is uh, an equation that sort of relate of uh, um, uh, this set of uh, time frequency shift. If you look at what you sort of saying carefully, you look, at, you'll have a point zero zero, that's just a point zero zero. You have a point A zero, which is here. But then here you have a point zero one, and over here you have the point zero minus one. So if you think about what those points are sort of doing, um, what you realize is that uh, those are going to sort of be point in a two two configuration. So let me, uh, sorry, uh, they're not going to be in two two configuration, but they're going to have a following property. So let me sort of sketch this for you, and then you're going to see what just happened. If that was the case, then the point that you're going to get this set of points right here is going to be zero, zero, one, zero, negative one, zero. So negative one, one, zero. And then the other point will just be arbitrary. But Kyle, Ramanathan, and Topiwala prove already that if you have all your n minus one point on the same line, and if the point are also equispace, if you pick any other point outside that line, the HRT conjecture is true. And so we use something that's already known to make uh, this, this conclusion. Now you might sort of uh, be a little bit uneased uh, by the fact that I assume that the function is real value. And so that's a concern that I have myself. Uh, I, I feel like if you're dealing with real value function, then uh, you, you might want to sort of maybe stick to uh, linear dependence as a real vector space, or you might want to sort of change the exponential to like trigonometric or uh, to uh, cosine and sine. 
in which case this problem is still is probably going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, however, if I make that sort of uh, um, assumption and uh, I assume that I'm talking about complex uh, uh, vector space, then we sort of show that uh, the HRT conjecture has to be true for all one three configuration when I restrict to real, real value function. So the last uh, result that I want to highlight is uh, before I move to, to the last part of the talk is this result by uh, Vignon Usa and myself which is taking like uh, this, uh, the same idea. So, so far we want a uh, one three config, uh, sorry, one N configuration. I don't know if the HRT is true if I don't make the extra assumption that the point on the line are uh, equispace or that the, uh, the function is real value. So it turns out that um, uh, we, we don't need any of those assumption. And uh, Vignon and myself, we proved that if you have a set lambda prime, which is comprised of a given set lambda, and then one extra point. If a set, if a point in on the first set are all on a line, then the HRT conjecture is true. So we can remove actually finally remove the condition that the point on the on the line have to be equispace. Uh, we also prove that if all your points are on the unit lattice, and you pick one point not on the lattice. As long as you can sort of ensure this sort of uh, irrationality condition between the ratio of B and A, then the HRT conjecture is true if, in addition, you restrict your function to be in a smaller class. So this is a class of continuous function that um, more or less sort of uh, are locally uh, summable, essentially. That's what this amalgam space is. So I don't want to sort of uh, go into, into the proof of this, but what I want to sort of uh, take away from here or what I want you to take away from here is that I'm making an assumption on a set of points for which I might know that the HRT conjecture is true. And what I'm trying to do is to test a new point. And that's a question that I want to sort of put in a more formal way. So the question goes as follows. Suppose you know that the HRT conjecture is true for a function G, and the set of points. So somebody somehow told you that the HRT is true for G and the set of points. Can you tell me if I give you one extra point so that your set now has N plus one point, can you tell me whether or not the HRT conjecture is still true for the same function and for this new set of points? Or can you at least tell me what, are, what point can I sort of always rule out that, oh, this point, this point are going to be bad? Or what point can I sort of guarantee that of the HRT conjecture is going to be true when I add those, those new points? And all these results that I just mentioned have that flavor. I know the HRT conjecture is true on lattice. I pick one point of the lattice and I'm trying to determine whether or not it's still true. So I want to try to answer this question in a more systematic way. So how do I set up this, con uh, this, this problem? So in fact, this is an idea that I had like the first time I heard about the HRT conjecture. That was when I was in grad school and uh, Chris Hyde mentioned this to me. Uh, I thought there have to be like a connection to some sort of linear algebra. And uh, I mean, I, I think if he, he was here, he will tell you that uh, I, uh, I thought like he was joking when he mentioned this question to me because I thought what could be easier than to determine that finitely many points are linearly independent. So uh, it took me 20 years to realize that this is uh, indeed very difficult. But this idea that I had uh, uh, goes as follows. So uh, I'll denote by gamma lambda prime the set of new points. And uh, the original set of points, I'm going to call them lambda. So I know the HRT conjecture is true for those set of points. So if it's true, then if I look at the gramian of a system of function are uh, considered of this, of this uh, uh, n plus one point, uh, sorry, n plus one function, then I know the Gramian has to be a positive semi-definite, right? And for the HRT to be true, all you need to do is to show that the Gramian is actually positive definite. So you can actually write the Gramian in a block form. So the top block here will just encode all the information about what you already know. This is the end point that you started from, you know, those were lead to linearly independent time frequency shift. So I know this is actually positive definite. This U of AB, I did not write what it is. I'll show you an example what it is in a minute, but this is essentially a vector that sort of uh, collect like a uh, uh, short time Fourier transform of, of a function G with uh, itself at various points. And especially it collect them at the point that you're trying to test. You're trying to see whether or not the HRT conjecture is true or false at this new point A and B that you get. 
And uh, this one here is just coming from the normalization of, uh, the, of the window G that I chose. So if you look at uh, this Gramian, you can actually show that the Gramian is similar to this uh, diag uh, block diagonal uh, matrix. So where on the top diagonal, n, plus n, uh, n by n, you have the original Gramian. We know this is positive, definite. And then you have a scalar. And this scalar, it's right here. We know also because this is positive semi-definite, we know that this number is greater or equal to 0. Our goal is to show that this number is not equal to 0. And if we can show that for any point, then we know that the HRT conjecture has to be true for at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into a function. I'm going to call that the extension function. And it's going to be a function of two variables, a and b. And uh, you can sort of prove various things about, about this function. So I'm, I'm listing them here, but I'm not going to sort of prove any of these statements. So the first thing you can say is that the function, it's a uniformly continuous function of a, b. It's a function that goes to zero at infinity, and uh, this function integrate to n. Um, so um, the function takes all, only value between zero and one, and it's exactly equal to one at the point a k b k. What are the point a k b k? They were the original point that you gave me. So the, the function achieve its maximum value at the original point, and to prove that the HRT conjecture is true, one has to prove that there is no other point where the function achieve maximum value. Its maximum value. So from, uh, from, uh, from that, you know that the, the, this will be linearly independent if and only the value of the function at the point A and B is less than one. And because the function goes to zero at infinity, uh, we know that we can find a big rectangle or a big ball so that the HRT conjecture is true as long as I pick point outside, uh, outside that ball, right? Because it goes to zero at infinity so I can make it less on any number I want to as I go far enough. So this make the HRT conjecture, I mean, at least this formulation, make it a local, a local problem. The final thing I want to mention is that uh, the function is actually related to the determinant of, of a gradient. The function is just like um, a factor in the determinant of, a, of the original gradient. This is a determinant of the starting matrix of a starting system that I, I started from. We know that this is strictly positive. Uh, in fact, it's not zero, that's all we care about. And our goal is to try to show that this is not equal to, to, to one or uh, to zero. Therefore, the function a b f of a b is not equal to, to one at a and b. All right. So let me sort of try to sort of uh, spell this out in a very special case, a case of uh, two points. So I'll start with my lambda having only two points. This have a two point. I can always do that. And then I'll, I'll add one point and I want to see what this function f of a b look like. So you can write in this case, you can write the matrix explicitly. This is what I called earlier. This should be G2, that the matrix G2, I call it A in this case. And the vector U of AB is just a short time Fourier transform of, of G with itself evaluated at the point AB first, and then evaluated at the point A, B minus one. And then here are some pictures. I don't know if they are clear now. So here I display what happened when you uh, apply this to the Gaussian. So here I start with uh, two points. Here I start with three points. Here I start with four points. Uh, this is just to check that this makes sense. Like the Gaussian, we know from the high work that any Hermit polynomial lead to linearly independent set. And uh, any three points are linearly independent already by the HRT. But this sort of uh, completely sort of uh, give us a validation at least just that this is uh, this approach that I just described uh, has merit. So for the Gaussian, this is what you get. Uh, this one is uh, for the function. The function here is one divided by one plus absolute value of x. I believe at the time when uh, when uh, I actually had this uh, picture produced, uh, Benedetto and uh, Buriaya have not uh, published their paper yet. So at the time, I don't think it was known whether or not like a rational function, square integrable rational function. Um, uh, will lead to a positive uh, um, result about the HRT conjecture. But uh, at least the picture sort of showed that uh, this, this was indeed the case and uh, independent of, of a number of points. Uh, clearly, there is a big difference in behavior between the Gaussian and, uh, and this function. You can sort of see that, uh, I don't know if I sort of chose the, the best angle to show this, but uh, even though this goes to zero quite fast already, uh, it still has some sort of high peak near near uh, where the maximum are. Uh, this is n equal three point, and I believe this is n equal to four point. 
And the last one that I want to show is of the same graph with uh, the function is exponential of minus absolute value of X. And again, the, fu the function F of AB dies out very fast. This is for N equal to 10 point, And this is N equal to, to five point, I believe. Uh, these are a result that, again, that uh, uh, one can sort of get now precisely from the work of uh, Benedetto and Boriaya, as well as uh, the work from, uh, from uh, Bonick and, uh, and Spiegel. So if you want to sort of prove the HRT using this, uh, this approach, uh, at, at least in a special case, so I want to prove it by sort of showing that, okay, if I put, pick the point A and B, uh, in, um, in uh, so I think I make a small typo here. So here I want A and B to be in Z uh, cos R. So this should not be Z square, it should be uh, Z cos R minus this point. So I can take the, uh, the, uh, the S coordinate to be uh, an integer, but the Y coordinate can be anything. Um, then the proof goes as follows. You can prove that the function is symmetric with respect to the line B equal to one half. Um, and if you sort of uh, think that, if you agree that that's the case, then you can see why the HRT conjecture is not going to be true. Because if it was true, then if there was a point where F of A, B is going to be equal to one, then at the same point, F of A, one minus B will be equal to one if B is not equal to half. If B was equal to half, F of minus A, one half will be equal to F of A, one half. But in either case, look at what you have. You have zero, 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 one, and then you have A, B, and then A1 minus B. So uh, A1 minus B will be somewhere here. And so these are two points, four points that are sitting exactly on two parallel lines. This is a two, two configuration. And if you look at this one, you have the same thing. You have zero, one, zero, one, and then you have A1 half, uh, and then A neg a negative A1 half, so A1 half, uh, sorry, a one half will be somewhere here. Uh, and then a negative one half will be, negative a one half will be somewhere here. Uh, I think I might have swapped this, so this should be, I think I swapped the way I sort of put this point. There should be a two, two configuration or a one, three configuration. But again, this will sort of fall into, into the category of things that were already known. And as a result, the HRT conjecture will sort of be true. But this is something quite subtle, right? Because I started from three points and I go to a set of four points. So it looks like if I know something about four points, then I can say something about three points and vice versa. So my, my premise in this whole thing was I start from n point and I want to go to n plus one point. And here I see that, oh, those three points that I started from are related to a special case of four points that I know how to solve. And uh, this is not actually something that just happened just in this case. In fact, it happened also like uh, if you were to do the HRT in general for four points. And if you assume that your function is again real value, you play exactly the trick that I told you uh, earlier. You take the complex conjugate of the linear dependence relation. You're going to end up showing that, oh, if that were the, was the case, then the HRT conjecture will be false for that function G and this set of points. And what is that set of points? If I were to draw it, it will be a point where I have three of the points on the same line and they are equispaced. But then the other point I have are on, this is A and then B and then A minus B. So they are on a separate line and they are also equispaced. So if somehow I can sort of find a way to prove that the HRT conjecture is true for this configuration, which is a 3-2 configuration, then I'll be able to prove that the HRT conjecture is actually true whenever you assume that your function is real, is a real, real value. And that's one of the results that I, I uh, obtained. Uh, not in general, it's not true, uh, or at least I have not been able to prove it that uh, this is the case for every A and B. Uh, when A and B are rational, and then I take exactly the configuration that I just show you, uh, when A and B are rational, there is nothing to do. This is well known. Uh, the case that are sort of tricky to deal with are these last two cases. And uh, this is, uh, again, a place where the ergotic theorem will sort of uh, play a big role. And I believe the proof that I had in this case probably push the ergotic theorem, at least in this particular application of it, to its limit. I don't think one can get any more thing out of, out of this. 
uh, we're still not sort of completely finished with, uh, with this because we still have many case. And so um, it does not sort of imply automatically that the HRT conjecture is true for real value and four point. It's true for real value and four point as long as I pick the point to sort of satisfy this, this uh, rationality or irrationality condition. All right, so I'm coming to, to the end of the talk. So I've been sort of trying to get across like uh, maybe a numerical approach to the HRT conjecture. And for that, I want to sort of highlight another result in, uh, in a high Ramanathan and Topiwala original paper, which is a perturbation result. And let's see what it says together. So given any finite set, if you give me a function G in L2 such that the time frequency shift are linearly independent. So suppose I know the HRT is linearly independent for a given function G and a given set lambda, then I can find a number epsilon such that uh, if I take any function with an epsilon of G, then the resulting system is still going to be linearly independent. So what this is telling me is telling me that for a fixed set lambda, the set of function for which HRT is true is an open set in L2. We already know that that open set contains the compactly supported function or linear combination of any function. So for a fixed lambda, the set of function for which the HRT is true is actually an open dense set in L2 of R. And the, the question is whether or not this set can be sort of proven to be the entire L2. And that's what the HRT uh, is asking us. Uh, I feel like uh, maybe one can sort of uh, get a little bit sort of uh, better intuition by actually trying to sort of uh, quantify exactly this, uh, this epsilon. And it turns out that this epsilon is related to um, essentially the smallest eigenvalue of a gradient that I sort of uh, show earlier. So that essentially like uh, a way to sort of uh, try to connect uh, this approach of the HRT that I was talking about to all these results that were already proved in the original paper of uh, Hyde and Ramanathan and Topiwala. So again, for me, it will be interesting to actually sort of find a way to actually estimate this. And uh, as far as I can tell, I think this epsilon is exactly the, the smallest eigenvalue of a gradient that I sort of uh, uh, mentioned a little bit uh, earlier. So another perturbation result uh, is that you can fix your function now and you can try to sort of perturb like a set of points that you have. And uh, in this case, again, you can prove that, uh, yes, there exists an epsilon so that if you sort of perturb your point with that epsilon, then the HRT conjecture is going to remain true. So finally, uh, something a little bit mysterious to me and uh, which is a result by Groshny. And uh, he came to, the, uh, this result will sort of be the opposite of what I've been talking about. So he suppose that you have an L2 function. Uh, plus some technical condition. I don't want to get into that technicality. Essentially, the function has to be in a, a, a weighted modulation space or weighted fighting a space. That's essentially what it is. Uh, suppose that you gave me uh, a countable set. So here I've been using finite set so far, but here lambda is countable. So a countable set so that uh, the time frequency shift of G along this set is a garbo frame for L2. So you have an upper frame bound, uh, the positive level of frame bound. Uh, you don't want this to be a risk basis. Then for every N, take the section of your frame that consists of all the lambda for which absolute value of lambda is less or equal to N. So I pick like, uh, I cut like uh, my GABO system at height N essentially. I look at all the parameter lambda who are in the ball of center zero and reduce N essentially. So I have finitely many points here. And what uh, Groshny did was to evaluate the lower frame bound of this finitely many set of, of time frequency shift of function. So as n goes uh, to infinity, he was able to show that this quantity, the lower frame bound has to go to zero. This lower frame bound is exactly or essentially related to the quantity epsilon that I was talking about here. And is also related to the lower, uh, lower uh, lowest eigenvalue of a gradient that I mentioned in the extension function that I, I put up uh, earlier. So it seems like what this is saying is as you start getting many, many more points, then the condition number of this frame or this basis of this finite base that you have is going to sort of start getting worse. It's not surprising because at infinity somehow like uh, you have to get a garbo frame, that's not a basis. So there have to sort of be some redundancy that you sort of start picking up as you're going higher and higher. But it that sort of tells that uh, maybe 
trying to sort of prove numerically the HRT could be sort of hard, uh, but I don't, I don't know if this is the only approach to sort of uh, trying to get uh, the HRT from a numerical point of view. So uh, I want to sort of end now to sort of uh, by inviting you to, to tackle the conjecture yourself. Um, um, for me, the case four point is still like a, quite a mystery. Uh, I thought many times that I was close to proving that it was true, but um, every time there is something that uh, I have not thought about. And uh, the, the main thing I want to sort of maybe invite people to think about is, uh, is there a more efficient numerical way to actually sort of uh, look at this question? The question came from uh, a time frequency analysis, wavelet analysis perspective. And uh, many of the proof, most of the proof of known result about HRT use somehow like hard analysis so far. Um, I'm not sure, uh, given like uh, the solution to the Carditon singer conjecture come from really like uh, some sort of applied point of view. I wonder if this is some sort of uh, a problem in the same category. And uh, just want to sort of come back to this question and uh, not sure if any of you at some point were able to solve any of them. Um, I, I can sort of give like uh, an overview of what's known, but in general, uh, we don't know whether or not any of this is linearly independent if we pick like an arbitrary L2 function. And with that, uh, these are uh, uh, some of the reference of my talk. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, most of the paper that I talk about will be on my website. You can download them and um, I'm, I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Casa. This is fascinating. Um, questions? So if if not, I, I actually have a question. Could you go back up to where you were defining this function uh, on A and B? Um, so it, maybe it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it's just me, but so the way I'm kind of imagining this is to think of this as being some kernel function that you've induced on the the space, on, on the A, B space, right? And um, so I, it's interesting. I don't know. May, you know, this, this may be my own confusion of it. But in these plots, you you sort of have these these bump functions that are getting closer and closer to each other, and the bump functions have different shapes depending on the the g, right? It it almost implies to me that like as they got incredibly close together, is there no like constructive interference that would somehow make f be greater than one? Because that's very surprising to me. That's that actually like that actually the way I think a counterexample can sort of come about. Okay. Uh, uh, I do believe like for four point, I feel like you shouldn't be able to do it for four point. I don't. I I I have no good reason to tell you why. But for if the number of points get large. I believe like one should be able to sort of uh, cook up a counterexample to prove that, yes, you can make this thing so close that you can pick up like an extra maximum at some point. Uh, and that's where like uh, the result that of uh, Groshning had saying that this frame bound gets like uh, uh, close to zero as you get very large. That way somehow I believe like, yes, maybe there could be a counterexample as you pick up more and more points. But I think like for small number of points, no matter how close you make this, um, I feel like for most reasonable function, you should be able to prove that is true. In particular for four, I'm almost sure that you can do it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because even for two, I just, you know, I, I have to imagine that like the, the shape of this, this bump is effectively fixed. And as you push them closer together, I'm just, it's, it's interesting that you don't have any sort but, of- But for two, you know, because of this, uh, you can use this metaplectic transform. It means like you can push them as far as you want, right? Because you can mm, sort of, uh, okay. so for two, there is no way. I mean, you can make them as close as you want, but you can sort of push them as far as you want. Got so it. for two, I can see it. For three, you can push two of them as far as you want. And then the third one is what you need to control. And uh, for that one, I feel like, uh, yes, that's why you can sort of, now when you start taking four or more, I believe you have more room to sort of actually construct something that's going to blow up. Interesting. Very cool. Other questions?
Uh, hey, Costo, uh, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I just want to ask you a bit about this uh, perturbation result and the connection to the smallest eigenvalue. So how, can, um, can how you, tractable? Can, can you give me just one minute? I need to sort of, uh, something is happening here. I need to take care of oh, okay. quickly. Sure. Sorry. Sure, sure. By the way, we can stop the recording and then... Um...